Good evening. I call to order the September 23rd, 2020 special public meeting of Cincinnati Public Schools and Cincinnati Preschool Promises Joint Collaborative. We welcome everyone here today. Um, and we ask all of the participants to please silence your cell phone. Okay, we'll begin. Ms. Bolton, would you lead us in the pledge? Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Bolton. Ms. Wagner, would you please call the roll for CPS? Mrs. Bates? Present. Ms. Bolton? Present. Mrs. Bowers? Here. Mr. Lindy? Here. Mr. Mester? Mr. Morosky? Here. President Jones? Here. Thank you. Father Graham, would you please call the roll for uh, Preschool Promise? Happily. Uh, Debbie Alsop? Here. Uh, Bianca Edwards? Perry England? Here. Christine Fisher is in expected absence. Marcia Futel? Here. Mike Graham? Yes. Tony Hobson? Here. Thank you. That's the quorum then that we'll need. Uh, Micah Cameras? Here. Gary Lindgren? Here. Odell Owens? Cheryl Rose? Laura San Regret? Here. Uh, Pastor Tate, or Bishop Tate, rather? Sally Westheimer? Vanessa White? By my count, uh, uh, we have eight members here and so a quorum. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So we'll proceed. Um, welcome, everybody. It, it's been a little while and uh, glad that we were able to uh, connect in, in this uh, uh, world of, of the digital, well, I, shall I say the digital world. And uh, I know we had a few jokes before about um, you know, how Zoom weary we all are, but then here we are, and it's all for the right thing. So um, just wanted to take a moment um, to talk a little bit about the agenda. Um, as you all know, we meet, uh, we try to meet on a quarterly basis. And for those in our audience who might not be familiar, this, this joint collaborative meeting at, on a quarterly basis is used to really help inform the public about uh, the activities of this partnership between Cincinnati Public Schools and Cincinnati Preschool Promise, all focused on uh, preschool, preschool expansion. And, and for those, uh, just to put it very simply, um, as you all know, the Cincinnati Public um, has a well-established history of providing quality preschool. And now with our wonderful partner in Cincinnati Preschool Promise, we've established a niche in our community for providing community-based um, preschool, quality preschool for uh, parents who uh, desire that. So we are very fortunate to have, uh, to have a great partnership. And we hope that tonight's agenda, which is very straightforward, provides you uh, uh, some information about our status, where we are now, a couple of things under discussion that we will be talking about, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to generate some ideas and questions as we move forward with, with this effort. So um, having said that, I'm going to turn it over to Father Graham. Father Graham, if you want to have a few opening words, that would be great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think you covered everything uh, uh, very well. It, it's the case that uh, the, the needs of our community and its children are uh, vast when it comes to uh, quality preschool um, opportunities. And so the partnership between the CPS and the community uh, providers, which CPP 
uh, brokers, as it were, uh, is vital um, in terms of delivering successful outcomes for our children and our community. Um, that was a sacred trust that the voters of Cincinnati placed in our hands um, in the in, uh, in 2016. Um, and so part of the purpose of today's meetings meeting is, as it were, to provide a kind of community update uh, as to how this partnership has fared and what its successes are, as well as to begin to look ahead to uh, um, what further uh, issues, uh, endeavors, and collaborations that will be required to become still more successful in the future. So I would, uh, speaking personally, um, the partnership with CPS has been a tremendous working relationship, um, and I'm very glad uh, to see the way in which both organizations uh, work together at so many levels on behalf of our community and its children. So with that, um, uh, Carolyn, I'll turn it back to you for... Uh, Thank you take us into heart, the heart of the agenda. Yes, thank you. Um, we're gonna start uh, the meeting off with uh, a couple of presentations. Um, Father Graham, would you please introduce the uh, first presentation with the CPP annual project? Sure. Annual report, I'm sorry. Sure, uh, this is uh, hot off the press as it were, um, but actually because of the nature of the, uh, of the report this year, um, it's not quite hot off the press because if you uh, print things, you lose all the hyperlinks and all of the rest of that. Um, and so this is uh, uh, th this annual report is something that we've uh, done for the last number of years to be able to track progress against the goals that we've set for ourselves on behalf of the community. Uh, Char Jackson, uh, who is our executive director uh, for the Cincinnati Preschool Promise, uh, will lead us through it. So Char, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you so much, um, Father Graham. We have, hopefully the digital display is gonna come up. Um, we decided to try something a little bit different this year and go with a digital annual report because that allows us to make real-time change, respects the environment that everybody is in, and um, can also share the story with a wider group than a print format may. Um, <clears throat> what you'll notice about the annual report this year is we were very deliberate in saying, um, how can we integrate our outcomes, what we know, our outputs, share our success stories, and integrate that specifically with the stories of our key stakeholders, which are the families, the children, the providers, and the community at large. So I'm gonna do some highlights and high points of this annual report. If you will notice first, we have a great um, letter um, from all of our board chairs, as well as outlining what our mission is and our vision. We then go immediately to the impact stories from our parents and have that as our first key feature. And you will see the Kennedy families feature. Um, this two page slide works very well, lets everybody leaf through it. You will then see on the next two page spread where we start to get into the heart of the story. We talk about tuition assistance um, and not only progress we've made year over year, but total in the life cycle of the preschool promise with over 4,700 preschoolers being touched with high quality education. What you'll also notice on this version is the hyperlinks that Father Graham mentioned when we talk about extended learning session and other things, you can click this hyperlink and hear from the providers and families themselves, their experience with preschool promise and the value. With quality improvement as well, you will see the great gains that we've made and the number of QI providers that have reached high quality from nine in the first year to 29 in the last year, all the way up to 62 total. If you click on each one of these boxes below, you will hear from providers who have gone through that quality experience and their videos that are linked to YouTube. On the next two page slide, <clears throat> you talk about, we talk about our equity policy, which was taken and drafted from the Cincinnati Public School Board equity policy as well. And we talk about the key demographics that show um, how we are applying equity in all the work that the preschool promise does. We talk about ethnicity, we talk about provider type, we talk about household incomes, and also how high quality preschool has come to the quality gap neighborhoods. On the next two page slide, <clears throat> you will see um, the response to COVID. This really tracks what the preschool promise has done um, from March to June and how our environment has shifted to be responsive to all of the needs that occurred due to COVID. 
on the active hyperlinks for these, when you see it posted on the website and other places, for many of these circles, you will be able to click on it and see the actions that happened on that date related to COVID. So if there was an executive order issued, you will see the executive order and a link to that when you click on it. If it was a professional development session happening, you will hear highlights from providers who experienced those sessions. That gives everybody real time and actual information from what happened during that COVID experience. On the next two page slide, you will again see impact stories. We are honored to have um, the story of Brenda Harris and nannies included and three generations of early childhood educators in the community in Avondale. And you also see our newest Avondale provider, Morgan Hill, who thanks to the assistance of the Preschool Promise, LISC, um, Greater Cincinnati Foundation and other contributions has gone from a family child care provider in her home to a brand new site in the Avondale Town Center. And again, hyperlinks to that will let you hear those words directly from those providers. On the next two page slide, you will then see our talk about sustaining quality teachers, knowing the importance um, that we have all focused on recruiting, retaining, and supporting with living wages, hot teachers to make sure that our preschoolers have the best educators, a financial snapshot of how much has been spent in direct program expenses. That is for Cincinnati Public Schools and community providers as well. And then for the first time in our annual report, we've also featured kindergarten readiness to show our true impact. How well is the preschool promise and high quality preschools doing at preparing children for kindergarten? These are pullouts and snapshots from the full report that Innovations did, and you will also have an active link to that in well, as well so that people can click through to specific sections of that evaluation to see the effectiveness and impact of the preschool promise. On the next page, you will also see um, additional stories and comments from our providers, a listing to all of, of all of our community providers, and a link at the bottom as well to all of the Cincinnati Public School preschool classrooms as well. That will also link to the website in a directory so that if people are looking for locations where community providers and CPS preschool classrooms are, they can find that very easily through that hyperlink. On the final page, you will see the story <clears throat> that talks about the COVID experience and how we will continue to keep the promises during COVID. While the timeline and the response is good for a snapshot in a period of time, we wanted to be sure that we were able to articulate that um, we really look to our parents and the community and the providers as partners going through this experience together to acknowledge the challenges that we faced, how we responded to those challenges, but also an ongoing commitment to be with our family and providers through the ongoing challenges and struggles and to make sure that we deliver on the promise of a high quality, equitable and accessible education. That is our snapshot and our digital annual report for our last program year. Char, are there, any, are there any particular highlights that you would like to draw people's attention to? I think just the hyperlinks were the, the key points there because many of the other outcomes, I know that the innovations team is gonna hit in terms of our deliverables and increases in quality improvement, as well as our tuition assistance numbers. And those are part of their comprehensive presentation. And I really would allow them as the external non-bias evaluator to sing our praises as well. Thank you. Okay, great. So now we'll entertain any questions or comments from the floor. And uh, I don't have a full take view of everybody. So I think we'll trust everybody just to uh, um, enter the conversation. Um, um, you know, just uh, let us know, just let us know either verbally or by hand. So we'll, We'll start, we'll entertain any questions or comments at this point. Wow. That's okay, Miss England. Okay. <laughs> Miss England. Hi, when I heard this report yesterday, I wanted to stand up and do cartwheels. I can't do a cartwheel, but I wanted to do one. This report, <laughs> it made my heart really happy um, that collaboration that we have with CPS and CPP, the parents, the city, and definitely the children are benefiting from this. This is, 
awesome. I think that Tara and the staff at CPP have done an amazing job. And I just want to shout it from the roof, and this should go on the ballot somewhere for issue 17. Um, we could not have done a better job for the, the providers. It makes me want to start all over again. <laughs> I didn't get the support, you know, when I was starting my, my center. And this is so absolutely needed for this community, particularly at this time. Thank you. I thank everybody for all of the providers out there. All of the parents, all of the teachers are benefiting from this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. England. Okay, additional uh, comments or questions for Ms. Jackson, Ms. Bolton? Uh, yes, I just, uh, I want to second what uh, Ms. England said. Uh, and I also want to say I really enjoyed looking through it and seeing the format that you used. Yeah. I think it's quite yeah. impressive. It, it not only tells the numbers and the vision, but also the personal and family stories of impact. I think we can take this to the voters with a great deal of pride on what you all have done and we've all done together over these several years. Uh, it's we've, we've, we've built the plane and it is flying very beautifully gracefully even. So to everyone that's participated, um, just congratulations. And I'm, I'm honored to, to boast about it and take it to the voters and, 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 and report. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Wonderful. So why don't we move forward? Thank you. And I and just in case you haven't read it, and, and I have as well, and and and, and is, am very impressed as well. Found it easy to read, easy to navigate, and just thoroughly impressed with the the amount of information that's there. And looking forward to hearing the innovations report. So I think that will add to the depth of the excellence that we see in that report. So um, thank you, Ms. Jackson. Okay. Anybody else on that subject? Okay, all righty. So I think we're ready to move on. Father Graham, did you ask, you want to do an introduction? Sure, for happy to, happy Mitchell? to. As people were uh, giving those comments, um, I couldn't help but think, uh, but wait, there's more, um, because we're going to be able to hear through innovations um, how it is that uh, these particular goals are being uh, de um, delivered against. But as well, um, that we're, we're seeing once again this year, as we saw a year ago, um, in the performance of kids uh, as they move into kindergarten, the exact kind of difference that we wanted to see in terms of, the, uh, of uh, what quality preschool makes. And so I'll turn things over uh, to uh, Dr. Um, uh, uh, Monica, Monica Mitchell um, and her colleague, who will lead us through um, that presentation. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to um, ask my colleague, uh, Dr. Hender, to pull up the presentation. Sure. And while she's doing that, I just want to say that uh, we're very much honored to be the evaluators for Cincinnati Preschool Promise. And um, just want to uh, say thank you to Dara uh, and the CPP team for the collaboration that we had this year, um, not only to, you know, work on the outcomes that you will see in our report, um, but also just for, um, you know, all the, honestly, the brainstorming that we went through to just um, really construct and expand on the evaluation that we presented on last, uh, during last year. So, um, if you can go to the next slide, uh, Kalana. Um, what you will see, so in addition to the um, report that Shara showed, which is, 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 is great and beautiful, we released two technical reports. Uh, this is the cover and the kind of table of contents of the first one, and this is the full evaluation, uh, which includes um, data that I will just give a, a very brief highlight on today. And we also released a second report, which is a qualitative report where we did 
um, focus groups, key informant interviews, and surveys that involve 200, about 200, oh, more than 200 um, parents, teachers, and um, providers um, that were included in that report. And I will feature some data from that report. Kalan and I will do that in, in the summary, but this really focuses more on the quantitative data that is, is part of the full evaluation. Okay, next slide. So um, we all know what the, the goals of CPP is. I'm preaching to the audience, so I won't uh, spend a lot of time on this, but obviously is to you know increase the number of um, children that we're enrolling in um, quality preschool slots, increase those number of slots, and ultimately um, to ensure that they are um, ready for kindergarten. So go to the next slide. Um, just to put this this year into context, as we know, COVID-19 um, you know, happened in the middle of the academic year, and that um, you know, disrupted the services that preschools were able to provide. And that obviously um, impacted some of the outcomes, um, but um, we were still able to have a successful year in spite of that. So we did footnote that in the report. We did dedicate a section to that. Um, and it actually um, was ended up being a strength in terms of the adaptability and flexibility that programs had and, and uh, continued to be able to fulfill the mission of CPP. So um, start, we really wanted to start off with kindergarten readiness um, and then kind of work our way backwards. So I talked about this last year, but I'm gonna talk about it again. You know, understanding the social and economic context of the kids that we serve is important. It was a big reason why the levy was, was passed because we know that, um, that many kids are not able to go to preschool and that creates a disparity in education and outcomes from the very beginning. So we wanted to make sure that we understood um, where kids are coming from in terms of um, how we interpret the data. And we use a really good um, tool. Um, CBI was our partner on this. So the Community Building Institute at Xavier and helping us using a geocoding methodology that's very sensitive and, and honestly um, maintains the confidentiality of all the kids to just say, where do kids live? And um, we, it goes from high risk areas all the way to low risk um, areas, and it codes kids in all 52 neighborhoods. And you can see, you know, red is high risk and blue is the lowest risk. And although kids come from high poverty in terms of um, the amount of money that their parents make, kids are dispersed um, in terms of their neighborhoods that they live in um, across the city. You can go to the next slide. And this, um, this tool is not just based on income, but it's based on a number of factors of the neighborhood. And it could be income, the poverty rate of the area, unemployment rate, and so forth. And it helps us to really um, interpret the data when we look at things like kindergarten readiness and where kids live. So uh, like last year, we had a very strong methodology and we wanted to replicate that methodology. And what we did is we looked at um, kids who received tuition assistance through CPP and we wanted to match them uh, identically because of the, um, you know, the, the broad database of kindergartners, we actually are able to do that um, very easily and we can provide a one-to-one -one match for kids who receive tuition assistance and find a counterpart um, who is of the same basically SES um, neighborhood so that we know that they're kind of exposed to those same factors and then match them on gender, race, and, um, and on every factor except for whether or not they got tuition assistance and whether or not so far as we know we at least know if they were in CPS preschool or not and we can match them so that really, you know, theoretically all that we're controlling them on is whether or not they got tuition assistance or any preschool experience so far as we know. Go to the next slide. And this provides us a perfect match. So of the, you know, 595 kids um, from CPP who are kindergarten eligible and matriculated to CPS preschool, 
um, we were able to find that non-participant comparison um, match. And you can see uh, because there's, you know, about 3,000 plus kindergartners, we can find that match pretty easily and provide basically an identical cohort match. And when we, um, after we find the match, then we act, then we can compare those kids on, compare both groups on kindergarten readiness. And we look at two outcome variables. So the first one is we look at them on their overall KRA score, which um, takes into account the eight subscales within kindergarten readiness it could be social you know social factors um, social factors language and literacy and the other components of kindergarten readiness and we find that um, on average um, our tuition assistance group scores higher than the um, students who did not receive tuition assistance and it's about nine points higher and then it's also important to note that um, kids who receive tuition assistance are also less likely to be in that bottom group, the emerging group, and that represents kids who um, need extra support when they get to kindergarten. So um, either way you look at it, um, CPP kids do better. The other outcome me measure that we look at is language and literacy. Um, obviously, we'd like you know, we'd like all kindergartners, to, we would like 100% of all kindergartners who come in to be ready for kindergarten, um, you know, but for, for the purposes of this analysis, we're comparing, again, the CPP kids to the comparison group, and on average, um, CPP kindergartners do better and about 10 points better, which is a, a statistically significant difference. So going back to the SES, um, we want to look at this because we want to see if there are differential outcomes for certain SES um, groups than others. And um, what we see is that all groups, and again, these are high poverty kids because that's, you know, those are the kids who qualify for CPP. Um, all groups do better than the, all CPP TA groups do better than their non-TA um, counterparts. But if we were to combine, say, SES 1 and 2, um, we would see, and you can see over here on the left, left hand part, you know, if you look at the 6.9 point difference and the 13.2 point difference and average those, the SES 1 and 2 would do better than, say, SES 3 and 4. And that's probably just uh, potentially because of some of the environmental um, supports maybe that that the SES three and four get. And we we find this year after year when we when we look at the overall KRA scores. Um, and that would be true too for the CP, CPP as well. So you can go to the next slide. We see the same pattern when we look at language and literacy scores. All groups are benefiting, which is great. That's what we would want to see. And again, you know, SES one and two have positively differential outcomes in SES three and four. Um, so that's great, and that's um, really the model of um, CPP is to ensure that kids who have the greatest risk benefit even more. You can go to the next slide. Um, so in summary, I'm just going to kind of collapse all these into a couple of points. Um, and, you know, we see that um, that the TA kids are doing better than their non-TA counterparts. Um, we also see, again, that differential impact of SES where those um, who have higher risk factors are doing better, which is good. And then the last and most importantly, important point, which I couldn't say last year because last year was the first year that we looked at this data, is we're seeing these trends um, two years in a row, which is great. Next year, if we see it three years in a row, that'll be even greater. And we can really more definitively say, gosh, you know, CPPTA is for sure, you know, making a difference. Um, and, you know, we need to, I'm, I'm saying it this year, but next year, the more years we start to see that trend, um, the more we really, you know, need to continue to put our state further and further into the ground. So I'm gonna hand it over to Kalana, who's gonna talk about the rest of the outcomes. So in this next segment, I'm going to cover tuition assistance, access to preschool, quality improvement, and teacher support. So here we have uh, demographics for the fiscal year 19 and 20 cohorts of CPP TA preschoolers. 
So as you can see, there isn't much variation between the two years. The fiscal year 20 cohort has slightly a slightly higher percentage of girls enrolled. There is very little change in the racial uh, ethnic, ethnic makeup between the two years. There are slightly more Spanish speakers in fiscal year 20, and the income breakdowns are very close as well. So the tuition assistance provider network has really grown over the past three years. The network has more than doubled since fiscal year 18 and has grown by 29 providers over the previous year. Similar to the provider network, TA preschool enrollment has grown over the past three years as well. So there was a 53% increase from fiscal year 18 to fiscal year 19, and preschool enrollment was trending upward uh, in fiscal year 20, uh, but COVID-19 intervened around February. And just for reference, from February to the end of fiscal 19, preschooler enrollment increased by around 20%. So we know that no two years are alike, and there's no guarantee that the growth rate would be the same, but we could expect that enrollment over the last four to five months of fiscal year 20 would have continued to improve. So now I want to talk about access to quality and high quality preschool. As of the end of fiscal year 20, there were a total of 195 providers. 87 of those were tuition assistance providers and 108 were quality improvement providers. So combined, they represent over 4,500 seats reserved for preschoolers with over 3,000 of those seats being offered in high quality preschools. So this figure is a map of community preschool sites. The pink areas represent quality gap neighborhoods. So as of the end of fiscal year 20, there were a total of 97 sites in the quality gap neighborhoods. 43 of those offered tuition assistance and 57 of those were quality improvement providers. So on to the coverage of the quality improvement program. The quality improvement provider network grew to 141 by the end of fiscal year 20, which is an increase of 15 over the previous fiscal year. The quality improvement program, which includes step up to quality coaching, also converted 33 providers from quality to high quality in fiscal year 20. So you can see this is an improvement in conversions over the previous fiscal year. Um, but again here, I must note the impact of COVID-19 as the step up to quality rating process was temporarily halted beginning in February due to the pandemic. So the conversion numbers likely would have been even higher. Uh, so now I want to switch gears to talk about uh, CPP teacher support as a method to supplement teacher wages and support retention and recruitment. CPP provided teacher promise grants of up to $2,000 for lead teachers at tuition assistance providers. To date, CPP has supported 57 teachers through this grant, 11 of which were granted in fiscal year 20. So next, I'm going to talk about, uh, basically summarize our findings and talk about next steps and opportunities. Uh, Monica, do you want to chime in here? Um, yeah, I mean, I can, I can wrap this part up, sure. So I'm going to uh, just kind of hit the highlights of our findings here, just in case if people have questions, I want to save some time for that. So, um, much of this we've already said, but this is these are some of the highlights from the report. So as we mentioned, um, there's been a growth in uh, the number of TA providers. I think um, much of this was also highlighted in the um, in the annual report as well. Um, we also saw a growth in the um, number and support of QI providers, and that's important because the QI providers are the ones who are the one and two two rated stars. So when we get those providers in the pipeline then that's really the first step to improving quality um, and, and creating more seats. And um, with both the TA providers and the QI providers, 
um, as mentioned here, many of those providers were in gap, gap areas. Um, thirdly, the um, low income preschoolers and parents benefited from CPP, and I talked about that um, both with respect to um, you know, the kindergarten readiness data with the SES data, um, but we also know that based on CPP's mission that we're targeting um, low-income families primarily. Next slide. Um, here, both with the quantitative data and through the Teacher Promise Grant program, uh, we know that CPP is supporting teachers and providers also, parents, um, I was really happy that we got so much good data from parents. We were able to get a lot of the, the focus group data before COVID hit, and that's where we really learned um, how much parents appreciated uh, CPP, um, you know, how much, for example, 90% saying that how important tuition assistance was. Um, how much they appreciated the communication and the resources that CPP provided. Um, you know, I think the last two points are especially important, you know, responsiveness and innovation, the pivots that many of the center, centers had to make with respect to COVID, um, and obviously the commitment to quality <clears throat> that uh, CPP uh, makes with respect to its mission and vision and um, obviously that kept cascades down to the individual centers and providers as well. So finally, um, you know, next steps and opportunities, reaching preschoolers and parents. Some of the feedback that was constructive is parents <clears throat> saying how important it is for them to, to get resources some parents still do not rely on uh, digital technology, social media, those kinds of things, and they really do need somehow to get information through grassroots means, paper, paper. Um, some families still didn't really, hadn't even really heard the term preschool promise, those kinds of things. So communication has, has to be a part, has to continue to be a priority for CPP. Um, supporting providers during uncertainty. Um, you know, I think many providers are, um, are, you know, still trying to figure out how they're going to, you know, they're living day to day. They're still trying to figure out what next month looks like, what next year looks like. We heard that early on. I mean, we were doing these focus groups in March and April, and um, I'm sure that, that some of their anxieties have only increased even since then, um, and then promoting learning and development um, for, for teachers. Um, not everybody, the, the Promise Grants weren't necessarily a draw for everybody, but everybody was interested in how to, how to, prom how to promote their professionalism in some way or another. Okay. And um, I'm just gonna really, I think some of these speak for themselves, but I think the summer learning loss um, CPP were they were the uh, CPP was able to uh, address that through some of the programs that were offered um, last summer and I think trying to figure out how to kind of institutionalize summer programs um, will be important and then the final point is advocating for teachers wages as a way to retain and recruit and retain teachers I think we all know is important to not only teachers, but is important ultimately to um, the success of students. So on that note, I'm going to, um, you know, close it out with this particular slide here, which um, is a really powerful quote from a parent that I think summarizes kind of everything that I've said, which um, this parent said, CPP has helped more people get access to quality preschool. Uh, this is the greatest gift the city has been given. I was struggling a, a little bit paying, and I thought I was going to have to pull my daughter out of full-time care, and she could only go so many days. I applied for CPP tuition assistance, and I got some help, so I was able to keep her there full-time. It was a blessing because I did not think I would qualify. And we 
heard this heard story, this story from, from so many people so many. who participated in the sessions. And um, I think it's a great quote to share, not only about CPP's purpose, but also CPP's impact. So if there are any questions, Kalan and I are happy to, to take those questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mitchell and your team. Um, if you don't mind, leave the presentation up in case if people have questions and uh, on some of the data points that you can go back. Um, so we'll open the floor for uh, any questions or comments about the report. And because I can't see you all, you could just jump in there. Carolyn, it's Pam. Yes, Ms. Ms. Bowers. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Hander. That was a um, very good report. And to Shara also uh, doing your presentation, very informative. Um, thank you. Dr. Mitchell, you pointed out um, at, the, at the end or following uh, closing uh, about some parents and some of their struggles and where their priorities were, uh, which is basically, I heard you say, basically about survival and just what they were going to do from day to day and how this was not a priority. I mean, but they're just not connected. How, yes. uh, moving forward, are there any plans around social emotional support for the children? Because they are going, they're feeling some of these things the parents are, the ones that are either not involved or the ones that are involved, the struggles of day to day are just some of the anxieties about some of the inconsistencies that have gone on since COVID. Is there any um, area to focus on social emotional support for, for our preschoolers? Thank you. That is a really great question, and I'm so glad that you asked it. Um, I think many of you know that I'm a psychologist. That's my primary <laughs> training. Um, and one thing that I've learned, I've, um, I'm on the uh, return to school team at, at Cincinnati Children's um, um, related to COVID. And one thing that I've learned is that school is a, is a safe place for kids, <clears throat> for many kids. And the reason why I brought that up is because CPP and the providers and the teachers play a play a very important role, especially during COVID, especially when you're talking about survival of families um, and providing stability, creating routines for kids, which is important. You know, kids' routines have been disrupted during this time. And, um, you know, I've been learning lately how um, imp how now <laughs> um, how kids you know not that they want not not that they want to go back to school only for the learning but they really want to go back to school and they want to be connected to school because it was their safe place so you know any way that we can um, reinforce that I think to providers and to teachers and have them um, you know, play, understand how important providing that social emotional support is in addition to, I think so for the past few years, we've been talking about reading and literacy, but reinforcing that, you know, the, the role that they play in supporting kids' social emotional development is just as important, hopefully will empower uh, centers. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it seems like I hear you saying that we need some work in that area. Um, providing support to teachers and or trainees or even how to support them so they can support their students uh, social yeah. emotional. So it sounds yeah, like there's work to reminded them of, of the opportunity yeah. that we have first and foremost. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I could weigh in too as a, a response to that, um, it, acknowledging that um, you know, thanks to you, Mrs. Bowers, you told us early on that you had resources for that and we um, reached out to have those resources and we implemented a strategy that was first, how do we inform and offer additional resources to providers in specific professional development on how they cope with it and how they help families cope with it, curricula and training that are available. Um, very fortunate in having a great partner in Vera Brooks to say what are the what is a survey of all resources that are out there that we can then share across both sides for CPS teachers as well as community providers. We also took the initiative to initiate social media platforms where we had preschool chats and a Facebook um, page specifically for parents that at least once every other week, it posts something that relates specifically to mental wellness and social emotional development for parents to use directly and resources for their children. 
Right. And and I appreciate that. I, and I and I remember <laughs> you and I talking about that resource. Um, but it, with the report, I was seeing if there was some way for us to measure improvement in social emotional as, you know, education is knowledge gained. But how do we know that it's acquired and how do right. we see progress? And so just saying if there was a I don't know if ages and stages is something to measure with regarding that or not, but if the, we could incorporate that in some of this also, since that is a big part, uh, especially with some of the trauma that, that all of us have experienced over the last five and six months, um, that would be something to move forward. Where I mean, some guidance in that area. But we did get a start. I do remember that, Chara. Yeah. Right. And I, thanks to you. And I also think Monica and Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Hendred are being very modest. At the onset of the evaluation for this year, we really looked at to say what other assessments are in place so that we can evaluate the impact of preschool promise other than just the KRA. And so that we are teamed up and ready to start doing that because we know that our community providers um, collectively probably do 10 to 12 different assessments that they use that measure social emotional whirling as well as those academic outcomes. And so the innovations team said to us, this may not be the year, but we will tee up and identify all of the assessments that your providers use so that we can start to measure that in subsequent years. And what we said to the team is we will incorporate that in the ongoing contract so that we know we can come back and report to you what the outcome or measures of those assessments may be for at least a small pilot group of providers, if not everyone. Sounds good. Um, and we do have some, we did get some of that data charge, just so you know. And for some of the measures, the spring assessments were not completed. So we were not able to report that in this year's report, but we did start to collect some of the preschool measures um, so that we didn't just have the KRA, just so you know. Thank you. Great. Other uh, questions? Just jump in. That's me. Go Are ahead, Mr. Lynn. Great. Uh, thanks, Carolyn. Um, for Dr. Mitchell, and I, I, share, I shared some of this with Shara earlier, but I just wanted to say how impressive I thought some of the uh, KRA numbers were um, and, and just how exciting that is to see. Uh, I think part of the um, research you see on, on preschool from other settings uh, is exactly this, you know, that like it has a big impact. Um, and I think, I think it's just great to see locally. Um, it was really exciting. I had, um, I had two follow-up questions about that. Have you... Um, has anybody played around yet with trying to do a cost benefit analysis on the size of some of those gains? There's just such interesting research out there on the long-term benefits of early childhood. And I have to imagine that even with what we've already seen, this is gonna like in the long run far outstrip the cost of this program. Um, and that feels like it's not the only reason to do it, but it's like one of a series of great reasons to do it. Um, is that something people are thinking about or looking into? That is a really good question. Um, so we, you know, thanks to the great partnership, honestly, and the great data infrastructure that CPS has, the only reason why we're able to do the level of analysis, um, you know, with the kindergarten readiness, attendance, you know, whatever we want to look at, we have we have just about all the components that we need to do a true cost analysis. Um, you kind of need multi-year data, I would say, to do a cost analysis. I always remind people of this, and it gives me so excited. Honestly, when I say it, I really get like goosebumps on my arm, so I'm, I'm already prepared to get that right now. Um, in two years, your, fir your first cohort will be in third grade, and that will be so exciting data. In two years, you will have fo four cohorts of data, um, which means you will have over 2,000 kids in your cohorts. And when you start to get power like that, you can do all kinds of analyses. So that's when you can really look at, you know, true cost analyses. Um, but you gotta have more than one variable. You gotta have more than kindergarten readiness. You know, you gotta have like attendance. You gotta have, um, um, you know, you may have to have like, uh, you know, some other outputs, you know, third grade, obviously. So you can have, you know, you may have to have mobility data, which there is a really cool analysis, a, a really cool way that we look at mobility, which is how many times have these kids moved between grades, which we would look at residential zip code of the kids. Yeah. Um, because there's a cost to that too, um, yeah. to the family. 
to the family and potentially to to the district. Um, you, so those are some really um, more complex analyses, but that's, you know, those are things that we would want to understand in terms of the benefits of not just CPP to the kids, but also to to society, you know. Yeah. I mean, and, you're, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to No, and what's great about it is that we have a match comparison group. So we wouldn't just be hypothetically saying, oh, you know, based on some national data that's shown this, we can say, gosh, you know, CPP kids compared to this comparison group, we're seeing, you know, differential kinds of outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I, in short term uh, and in the long term and in terms of cost benefit analysis. Yeah. ROI or those kinds of things. Yeah. I was just, um, I want to be thoughtful with everybody else's time, but I wanted to share my yeah. interest topic, you know, and if you ever want to bat around some ideas, I mean, you're, you're the expert here and love I'm to, not. Love to do it. Love to do love it. Love to have okay. this conversation. Okay. Anybody, any other questions, comments? Okay, hearing none, um, again, I want to thank Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Hendert for coming in to present the data. Um, we, we truly appreciate that and we look forward to the next uh, in, uh, piece of information. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you so much for the invitation and I'm really excited about the data. I'm excited about the direction. I believe that CPP is making a difference and mm -hmm. that we will see even more benefits from these kids. Usually it's um, the benefits compound are compounded over time. They don't diminish over time. So I'm really excited about that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on now. I'm going to ask Superintendent Mitchell if she would please introduce the uh, final presentation of the evening. Absolutely. So thank you. Uh, we're really excited to be able to have Vera Brooks, who is our Director for Early Childhood, along with Shar, present a, a joint PowerPoint that shows the power of the partnership and the uh, strength that we share with CPP as a, as a strong partner. So they're going to talk about some challenges and accomplishments and, and to be very brutally honest about the things that are working extremely well and the areas that we want to show some improvement in, in terms of moving forward. So at this point in time, I'll turn it over to Vera Brooks. Okay, thank you very much, Superintendent Mitchell. And good evening, and I want to thank everyone for allowing Shara and I to do our first time um, joint presentation. Um, we wanted it to be, if that's all right, we do not have a PowerPoint, but more of a conversation to share with you all some wonderful things that are happening as far as accomplishments, some opportunities, some challenges that we are having, and also how we are looking moving forward. I do want to begin by just saying I appreciate um, Ms. Fisher Jackson tremendously. We have a weekly on the calendar every Monday at 2.30 uh, check-in, but our check-ins appear to be more than once a week. Um, so we are continually in communication back and forth. So some of our accomplishments that we are seeing is that with our common vision and goals that have been set before us, that we really are showing a building of that community um, within the CPS boundaries, that we are all coming together and as sharing resources, that we're able to reach more in a variety of ways, as Shara mentioned earlier, around the social emotional learning and the instructional programming. Also through our expansions on both sides, um, that it, we are servicing and providing access to more children and to more families, which is extremely exciting. So Shara, do you wanna talk about some of our wonderful providers that have moved from QI and on? Absolutely. Um, the expansion, you know, has been something that has happened jointly and been very beneficial because as more providers move to high quality, we know that the families that they serve then are able to access tuition assistance. And we've seen lots of our growth um, come from not new students, but students that are from um, recently awarded high quality providers. Um, we've also been very fortunate in partnership 
um, with Vera and her team to continue our collaborative efforts to be transparent about our data and where our growth is. So much to we've had six convenings this year where we've gotten on calls to have community providers with CPS teachers and educators and members of their staff to work together to say, how do we challenge a common issue? And that could be anything from looking forward to professional development to how are we identifying special needs and assessing for that? And how do we all collectively deal with remote learning? That spirit of transparency and the camaraderie that we think we are building between the community, early childhood educator community and the CPS early childhood education community is invaluable. Thank you, Shara. Another area we have shown great growth um, has been in our kindergarten transition. We saw a gap um, a little over a year, about two years ago, of reaching out to find families to have them transition from our high quality preschools and centers into CPS kindergarten. And I especially want to give a shout out and thank you to Ms. Terry England, who was the first to open her doors to us last year um, prior to COVID. Um, she opened her doors and allowed us to come in and meet with her parents and actually help them through that transition. Once um, COVID hit, we, were no, we could no longer do that. But then Shara's team and my team got together and we discovered other ways that we could reach and talk with providers through um, providing them with postcards that had the scan on it to go directly to our online registration. Um, they invited us into virtual meetings and, and just other avenues to reach our families and um, help the providers with their kindergarten transition also. Also, we've really expanded on family engagement. Um, we're very excited that um, CPP has started a pilot with programs like Ready Rosie and just other resources for families in the area of, of literature that we have already had and we've expanded to our preschool children that now we are equaling that playing field of resources that every family will have access to. Jar, do you have anything you wish to add? Absolutely. The value of the, the partnership is that we also do very strategic cross marketing and communication so that every time there is a post on a CPS website that will be beneficial to families. We also have that post on the preschool promise website to make sure that all of our families that have preschoolers are aware of the resources and that those are accessible to everyone and what those resources are. We're proud of the accomplishments that we were only able to get to through working together, but we also recognize that there are some opportunities. Um, and some really significant challenges ahead of us. So Vera, I'll turn it back to you to talk about one of those challenges that we're very concerned about as we approach um, year four. Of year four with our assessment data with the KRA, which is now the KRAR. So we, I was very fortunate today that Director Leach with um, Cincinnati Public Schools testing, he informed us today that to do the KRA are the um, teachers were asked while they were in distance learning to do the obser observational learning piece because the state had said that we could not take the test remotely. Now that we are going in person, the goal is to complete the, the test hopefully by the end of October with a focus on the language and literacy, which is the area that we have focused on. But we are hoping that working with innovations who we greatly appreciate, um, we will be able to see ways that if that cannot occur for any reason due to COVID, that we will be able to look at all of the assessments. At CPS, our assessments for preschool are ages and stages, early learning assessment, and TS Gold. But we have discovered that providers may have different assessments. So we want to make sure that the assessments align, and that's where we will be working closely with innovations to see where to make sure we can make sure we are measuring that data as it moves forward into year four. As Shara mentioned earlier, we also are very excited to look at ways that we can look at and really evaluate how our children are doing with these social emotional learning. And are we reaching the, and teaching the areas that our children have the largest gaps in. So the big questions are coming up and challenges are what assessments would be used and 
collaborating to work with innovation so we do have that alignment. Dar, would you like to talk a little bit about staffing and, and, and salary scales, please? Sure. Another significant challenge we know that we're facing in the early childhood education community is recruiting and retaining teachers. This is not new, and we always talk about wages and how we get teachers there. That challenge has been expanded um, in a time of COVID to be not only about teachers, but all staff at early childhood education and community providers, from those that are front desk attendants to those that help prepare meals, um, to those that are only responsible for cleaning. We are seeing an impending crisis and what we know is staffing community provider locations. That comes from primarily three things. One, we know a large percentage of early childhood educators are aging out. They're at an age in which they're retiring or vulnerable populations that will not allow them to be in the workplace during COVID. We know that those that are on the younger end of the spectrum have school-aged children that they may need to care for or assist in their education so they're not able to maintain full-time employment outside of the home. They need jobs that they can work at at home and they're caring for their own children. The other thing is, um, in any model that doesn't have in-classroom learning, but a blended model that is happening all across the country, what we are seeing is that in many places at preschool um, sites and child care center sites, that sometimes the preschool classrooms are being replaced for school age kids classrooms. And the teachers are going there rather than staying in preschool. Um, there is a need for that. And particularly when the recommendations are that family groups stay together, um, many providers are choosing to say, we will take a whole family that may have a preschooler and several school age children and adjusting their classroom models in that way. So that before when we were able to say, we have a full classroom of preschoolers and that was the model and a sole teacher for that, some of those teachers and staff have to be deployed for school age children. We see a growing trend this way. So our concern is how do we shore up and maintain um, excellent, highly qualified staff to provide all the needs at community provider sites, while at the same time still striving for what we know is a need for livable wages and parity in the wages on the community provider and CPS side. Thank you. So moving forward in our next steps, um, we do want to continue to work in partnership to serve our families. We greatly appreciate uh, both boards and also Superintendent Mitchell, who takes time out really monthly and even more than that to sit down with Shar and I and a team to really discuss um, things that we can continue to move forward with. Also, we want to make parent engagement even more of a priority. We are seeing during um, these last few months, the value of that parent engagement, and we are discovering new ways that we can reach our parents and actually have those conversations and help them through these difficult times. We'll you continue to share professional development opportunities so that anything that we develop or sponsor is available to teachers, both in community providers and CPS sites, as well as taking direct feedback from all educators on what new professional development opportunities need to be developed, not only to meet the requirements, but to meet the current needs. We'll continue with resource sharing to address the changes in our learning environment from talking about how we all do remote and distance learning to new learning tools that we may need to learn how to use together, as well as increased data sharing that we know will need to happen as we move forward to know where those preschoolers are at CPS public school sites or they are at community provider sites and how they may be transitioning on with their families. That data sharing is key so that we can come back and share with you not only the outputs and the outcomes, but the true impact that we've had on the community and the families. Okay. Um, one area we are um, finding is a, a challenge, but we are planning and getting the next steps for is the tracking of stu student movement through the data systems. Um, we have never had this experience before where we've had in dis, um, distance learning, in-person, limited sizes due to square footage and things like that. So we are working together and Dar and I are starting to develop ways that if we discover a family to make sure that both at CPP and CPS, everything is followed through to ensure all the families are taken care of whether it's with CPS or CPP. 
Um, so it's very exciting, and we look forward to continuing working together. Are there any questions? Hey, any questions from the board, board members? Questions just, or comments? Just a comment. Uh, Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Messer. Yes, um, thank you both for that. Um, and, you know, just as I joined the board three years ago, kind of came onto this side of the table, I, of course, was involved in uh, making sure we got preschool pr promise uh, in greater Cincinnati. But since I came on board, there was transition on the preschool promise side, and then we had some transition with preschool on the CPS side. And I, what I just want to say is I think you two have really caught stride for the partnership. Um, I think it has been noticed by people in the community. In fact, it was brought up of how well they, the, this one particular group that I went to get support of the levy, how they thought it was just really great that CPS and Preschool Promise was really committed to working together. Um, and I just want to say just, just the way you present it and, and the way you represent that, I think it makes this program stronger. Um, CPS is stronger because of these community providers, as we heard early in the presentation. We're, we're filling gaps because of these small businesses that are helping our children and preparing them, again, as we saw earlier, to have better outcomes. And that's why I think we all got involved in this in the first place. So I just want to call out uh, the both of you and say thank you for your, your ongoing partnership and collaboration. Thank Great. you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mester. Any other questions or comments before we move on? Okay, so that, that's actually a, a very nice segue into our board <laughs> matters um, discussions. There are three items under the board matters um, agenda item. Uh, the first two, shared vision resolution and carryover spending resolution. These are both uh, action items that have occurred um that we've built on and done a lot of work to strengthen uh particularly the shared vision one that really sort of outlines um very poignantly what uh what our partnership looks like and so we've done some work and father graham i think you would agree that when you and i talked there this was probably a very important item that we wanted to bring back to the table for discussion kind of get an update on where we are in any kind of revision for uh the, this shared vision resolution so i didn't know uh dan hoying is going to give us an update on where we are sort of with the redlining process but i didn't know if you wanted to add anything um before he comes on just a very brief bit of context, Carolyn. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, the CPS board members will, will recall uh, that in August 2016, in advance of the uh, Issue 44 levy, uh, the, the CPS board passed a joint uh, vision resolution, the framework of which really became the architecture of the master agreement, uh, which sort of shaped the environment in which uh, CPP operates. Uh, we thought it would be prudent to update that document uh, for 2020, if for no other reason than uh, uh, what we now call the Preschool Promise is a different organization from what we called Preschool Promise back then. You know, there's a there's an actual um, uh, organization up and running uh, working with the with the uh, community providers and the like, and we thought it was important for the document to be updated uh, to kind of catch it up, if you will, to historical circumstances. So uh, the redlining has gone on, and you know that's a process that always involves the attorney. So I guess we'll turn it over to uh, Dan. Huh? Thank you, Mr. Hoy. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, we. Uh, put a draft together that was based in large part and uh, tracks much of the language, much of the substantive language uh, for that shared vision resolution that we used uh, prior to the 2014 uh, levy, uh, but then um, was updated as Father Graham indicated, especially uh, you'll remember that that uh, resolution had a lot of language about a uh, mythical um, trusted entity, which uh, became the United Way, very fortunately for all of us, and um, a preschool expansion organization, lovingly referred to as a PEO at the time, 
uh, which, which again became the Cincinnati Preschool Promise. So filling in those details uh, that that um, we've worked through over the last five years uh, was was largely kind of the draft we put together. We shared it with uh, PPP and Jake Purcell offered some. Uh, I think friendly and welcome to changes. Um, I've shared it with our board. I don't think our board has had much of a chance to discuss the kind of current draft, but that's that's where we stand. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions, Mr. Lindy? Um, yeah, I mean, you can tell me if, um, Dan, if I'm getting too far ahead of things, but I think one of the really interesting things that came up in the Finance Committee meeting last week was about um, this issue of just what happens with unspent funds. Am, am I remembering that conversation correctly? That um, I, I just want to mention that is our that is part of this uh, discussion, sort of the second presentation, which is a different resolution. Got it. Cool. So I'm gonna the shared that's it okay. It's quite all right. The shared vision one is one in context that basically summarizes and describes what the partnership is and, and that kind of thing. And uh, it really is sort of, um, uh, it, it sort of opened, it, it sort of the, the, opened the avenue for us to, to figure out how we market the partnership and strengthen the partnership. The, the uh, carryover spending resolution is next to be discussed and we'll have Jen um, to us that update. So if you could save your question, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments regarding the shared vision? Ms. Bolton? Yes, I think uh, uh, we've had an opportunity to look at it, and, and uh, uh, I think uh, Mr. Hoyne's right that the board needs to discuss it, but it uh, it does capture the spirit of the original one, and it does seem to uh, structure uh, around the things that have changed and, the, and this working partnership relationship that has grown. So it would, you know, uh, up to you, President Jones, as to when the board might be able to discuss it. I think the sooner the better, uh, in part because we're going to the community for uh, for the renewal and for uh, that to happen, I think it would be great to to rededicate ourselves to that shared vision in the in the more um, um, how shall I say it practical and visionary way that uh, these several years together have uh, made it be very much improved and stronger. So I, I really yeah. urge us to discuss it as soon as we can as a board, and I'm very in favor of it. Okay. I actually wrote it in my next step, so we'll we'll get that on the board agenda uh, maybe even next week for the next meeting. Okay, any other questions then about the uh, shared vision resolution? Just, just a comment as to process. Hi, this is Jake Purcell, Preschool Promise. Uh, Hello. One, one, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi. We can, once. DPS had a chance to take a look at the shared vision resolution, then I, I think that the most efficient thing would be to kind of funnel it through Dan Hoying and Dan and I are uh, pretty schooled in how we're handling this anyway. So then Dan and I can take it and, and I agree the sooner the better, but it doesn't sound like, and it was not intended to be any substantive issues in there. I think it was just right. a, an, an update as to timing. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I, I believe that it would be easy enough for us to get it on our upcoming agenda and uh, and just move from there. This is Mike Graham jumping in quickly. Um, from CPP's perspective, our next uh, board meeting isn't scheduled until I believe it's October 23rd. Um, and we would certainly want to act on this uh, well in advance of that. Um, uh, as everybody has, uh, has observed, jumping on this uh, to help create momentum towards the levy would be very important. And so I'll work with uh, uh, Chara and uh, others uh, to see what we can do about having a, a special targeted uh, meeting of the CPP board uh, that would be focused on these two issues in particular, uh, just to make sure that we can, uh, what, shake hands and continue uh, proceeding down the road. Great, thank you so much. All right, any other questions in the shared vision? We can move on to the, um, 
update on the carryover spending resolution. And I'm going to ask uh, Treasurer Wagner to jump in the conversation and Ms. Bolton as finance committee chair, please chime in. And Hector, is Hector on with us? If, if he wants to chime in, that would be great too. I also suggest that um, uh, Cheryl Rose, who chairs our Finance and Audit Committee, might be uh, also uh, part of the conversation. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Um, happy to address this issue. And so the my understanding is the resolution is an attempt to um, solidify what we had drafted as the carryover of unspent funds policy that we've been following for the last couple of years. Um, and the first couple drafts just had, I think, some terminology changes for the most part. But um, to, to summarize it it's in the simplest terms possible, it's any unallocated funds that we've collected for the levy or budgeted but unspent funds are segregated in a special cost center. That's the um, USAS terminology in terms of the state of Ohio's accounting system. Um, I think the original terminology was unspent funds account, but um, so we just changed it to update the state of Ohio's terminology as a special cost center. Um, Ms. Bolton, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, I think general counsel and, and uh, the, you, the treasurer, have done uh, good work in redrafting. It's, uh, it's appeared before, as Mr. Lindy mentioned, before the Finance Committee. Uh, in a, and we had a good long, I think a pretty long discussion uh, about it and had some reservations about some terminology and embraced the rest of the, of the terminology. And I think it's very frankly through the Treasurer and through uh, General Counsel, the draft that appeared before Finance Committee uh, is somewhat uh, has been somewhat adjusted uh, and is in particular uh, not only dealing with the unspent funds but is making sure that there is a, a dedication to maintaining whatever unspent funds there are are dedicated to uh, preschool expansion and preschool initiatives. So I think that's some a pledge that we want to see publicly so that the people know that the tax dollars they particularly voted, are going to continue to be for um, preschool. I think part of the dialogue that was uh, that occurred in finance was just the degree to which we coordinate or work together as to how each entity spends those monies. And the the issue there was the maintaining, if you will, of the independence of each board, uh, as well as the recognition that CPS was the taxing agent that. Uh, you know, kind of holds the money. So uh, I think um, the wordsmiths have started to come up with different words than necessarily coordinate, but talk in terms of consult and uh, uh, inform. And so I think that'll be something for the whole board to look at uh, in this uh, draft that is evolving. And also the preschool promise board having an opportunity, obviously, to, to react uh, via our councils. As uh, Father Graham mentions, it does invariably fall to the, the lawyers to help us through these things, but uh, uh, I think it's a, a resolution that strengthens the partnership, uh, has greater transparency so that we know what each other are doing, uh, but yet each board remains independent and the money is dedicated as the public has voted and trusted us to do. So um, very pleased to try to get that through uh, as well uh, so that we can uh, communicate that to the public and also have a, a stronger, as we witnessed tonight, even stronger sharing uh, partnership uh, between us as we spend this public money. Okay. Mr. Lindy, I wanted to give you an opportunity. I didn't know if you had something to add or a very specific question around that, if you want to, to uh Go ahead with your comments. Yeah, no, this this is perfect, Carolyn, and I appreciate it. Some of this is just like my new guy card. I think this is my first meeting of this group since I joined the board. Um, and, and I'll just share that uh, as an outsider prior to this, um, and you know, from my position with a with Teach for America and as a as a community member, what has always felt so impressive 
about this group was just the unbelievable coalition that came together um, to do something big for children in Cincinnati. Uh, and that, that people were willing to put the needs of kids beyond the needs of any one individual institution. I thought that was incredibly powerful. Um, and it's cool to be here on that. Um, I had just kind of assumed that because of that, any unspent funds, like decisions about them would be made jointly by those two groups together, CPS and Preschool Promise. I just wanted to check, am I wrong about that? Or, or is that is that the right way to think about it? Um, go ahead, Ms. Bolton. Um, I think the, the, the resolution that is evolving is talking in terms of consultation and in information, as well as not necessarily having either party be surprised as to how different money is being spent. But the idea that we are jointly determining how to spend it relieves the concept of having two very independent boards. We cannot necessarily tell one board or the other board and vice versa how that money is to be spent. We just have to make sure that it is spent in the way that we promised the public. And of course, is also, you know, what is that called? Proper public purpose. Uh, but I think there is there is not joint decision making, but there is joint responsibility to do what we promised the voters. Ben, this is Mike Graham. I'm happy to jump in here too. I think E. Bolton gets it exactly right, you know, um, that each organization, because of its different charge, the way it, uh, it, it goes about its work, uh, needs to be opportunistic um, in, in looking at possibilities and how it can uh, best serve uh, students um, and their families and therefore will, will need uh, often enough to make in, uh, kinds of investments um, that are appropriate to it. Um, and that what need not happen is for it to go to the other organization uh, to get that organization's permission for it. But what is important is that each organization knows, you know. So um, uh, for uh, from our uh, perspective, for example, as the preschool promise, something that was very important for us was to be able to move ahead with what was re referenced uh, in the earlier presentations in that summer extended learning as, a, as an adaptation to COVID. Well, that isn't something that, that, that we are gonna need to go back to CPS and say, is it okay with you if we do this? You know, <laughs> rather CPS has to simply trust uh, that we can operate with proper uh, institutional autonomy in order to do the job that's been entrusted uh, to us to do. Um, now, it is the case that these dollars um, uh, route through CPS ultimately. And so uh, CPS is, so to speak, on the hook for, for the expenditure of these dollars in a way that CPP is not. And that difference needs to be respected. Um, and, and so the question really is, it's the first uh, lesson that uh, you learn when you work for somebody, right? No surprises. Um, and so that's the kind of attitude that we're trying to strike here, I think. Yeah, and, and, and I, it might be helpful for context as well, um, Mr. Lundy, Lundy, Ben. I mean, it's so hard for me just to not to call everybody by their first name here, but um, is is the reality is that we did not know when we started this program how the budget was going to play out, and it's played out in a way that we didn't and we're not able to spend all the funds in the early earliest years of this. Over time, we're gonna refine that and we're gonna know what the cost and benefit is. And so I think for us, it's really about understanding that we have to maintain a level of flexibility, but we also have an incredible responsibility to the public to make sure that we are utilizing those dollars to support the expansion of quality preschool. And that to do that, it's important that we are collaborating between these two organizations. Cheryl, you bring a really good perspective in terms of the um, what's it, the RACI approach, uh, uh, and and maybe you could locate this discussion within that larger context because that was actually yeah. an outcome of one of these. Uh, I think it was our very first meeting. You and uh, Ryan Messer were off and running. Ryan on. Messer, yes, absolutely. And and you know Ryan had brought that to the table, and I think it was really helpful because what we realized is we hadn't articulated who's going to be responsible. You know who's going to be accountable, who's going to, when are we going to consult and when are we going to inform? And so creating that grid and operating within that, I think created a lot of clarity that frankly, I believe is a lot of the tensions that existed um, in the early days when we really didn't know what, 
what to expect. So now we know, know, know what to expect. We know how to share information and get it done. And I'm seeing that in spades and it's just so rewarding to see not only the way that we are working together now, but to see the impact that we have been able to have together. Pretty cool. Yeah, great. Carolyn, it's uh, Gary Lindgren. I had oh, a hi, question Gary. just, hey, Carolyn. Um, just following up, uh, Eve, uh, on your comments and and Ben's and and Jen. So is the is the thinking in terms of ensuring kind of the independent operation of the boards that any kind of surplus uh, carryover money would be just kind of set aside to be evenly divided between the two entities, and then the entities would have the ability to to make those investments as needed. Um, is that is that kind of the thinking that I'm hearing? I think uh, Jen could speak to that as to what the uh, the specifics are about the 10% or not the 10%. So maybe Treasurer Wagner, uh, Gary, would be the person to start to address that as to how it actually plays out. Jen? So um, early on, the state auditor advised us to have a policy in place when there was unspent monies and whether – my question was, does the funds have to be returned to the district since we are the fiscal agent? Um, and he advised that we come up with a joint policy, and we did, and we've been following it. It's worked really well. Um, the concern, uh, if you recall, we started collecting on the levy immediately in January, right after it passed, and there was a uh, determination to save that half year's collection to cover the last half year of the fifth year. Um, and so that money was kind of put set aside. Um, but when you look at our spending trends, as a, both entities are starting to spend more money as in investing in preschool, at the end of the levy cycle, there won't be a whole lot of unspent funds. Um, Hector and I, mostly Hector and I, worked on the, um, a forecast of what the next couple of years might look like if we continued on the same trajectory as we were. And so um, eventually we'll have to have that conversation about, you know, that last year and how to create a budget and and then if we I think this coming year fiscal year 21 is the first year that both organizations asks were greater together were greater than the annual revenue so we're starting to dip into that first year and underspending of the first couple of years and so if we move too fast that's not good either um, does that answer your question Gary yeah, it's help, helpful, Jen. And just going back to Eve's initial comments, just in terms of, you know, voting starts in a couple of weeks and wanting to be as transparent as possible you know, with the voters, I think on both of these resolutions, I, I just think it's important to understand if, you know, and, you know, Ben's comments about the partnership we have here, you know, how this will work. And, you know, if you, whatever the amount is, whether it's, you know, money that was budgeted but not spent, uh, or there's additional carryover funds, either that we're doing that jointly, you know, this, as two bodies making decisions, or you know, there's some allocation of those funds so we know that both CPS and CPP have equal opportunity to make those investments. I think that's what we committed to voters and you know all the providers out there. So I just want to make sure that in the next two weeks, uh, as Eve said, we can you know get to a final decision and make sure it's very collaborative and transparent to the voters. Yeah. And, and I'll add on that. I think that the reality okay. is any organization would say, oh, there's a pot of money available to spend. I'm going to go get some of that money. And we have to be really on, on the up and up about that and make sure that we're doing the right things for the right reasons. And, and it's equalized somehow, I think. Okay, thank you. All right. So uh, just... We, what we can do, um, I'm going to ask Ryan to do an update on the levy planning, but then the next item is to really kind of summarize what our assignments and next steps are. And I think it's very important for us to really summarize what we just said in terms of where we are and finalizing both the uh, chair vision and carryover um, resolution. Okay. Um, Mr. Messer? Ryan? <laughs> Did he disappear on us? There. I think I was double muted. Okay. 
Can you hear me now? Um, do you have a, are you able to give us an update on the levy renewal? Yes, um, I'm happy to do that on behalf of the uh, number of people on this call who have been uh, joining these uh, Friday morning chats at 9 a.m. for quite a while. Um, so I guess wave your hand if you're one of the people that's been uh, part of the team. Obviously, it is a, a cross-section of our community, including these two boards and many of our uh, stakeholder groups that are crucial for passing this. I'm just going to review a little bit of the verbiage that um, has been shared by many of us on this phone and others who have gone out to speak to organizations uh, to gain endorsements. And I will say the few that I've done have been extremely positive. Um, really didn't get any negatives. I think um, <clears throat> uh, one was really excited to see the annual report uh, just because they believed it would be a great validation of why they supported the preschool promise in the first place. Uh, but I have to say, even in the midst of COVID and, and uncertainty that we thought, we got that market research and said, well, it looks like we're going to be pretty good. The in-person has been um, really, really good. So the, the talk track has just been focused on the fact that issue 17, so we all should know issue 17 and tell everybody we know, uh, but that is a crucial issue to maintain a vital and proven educational partnership between the two bodies here, Cincinnati Preschool Promise and Cincinnati Public Schools. Um, the voter approval of issue 17, a key talk track here, won't raise taxes. It will renew funding to benefit 40,000 Cincinnati children. So you're talking the CPS kids, of course, and the preschool uh, children as well. Um, so really making sure that we are ramping and uh, further accelerating our CPS learning programs for K-12, as well as providing high quality preschool for Cincinnati's three and four year old children. Um, issue 17 is the renewal of the levy originally passed in 2017. Since then, 7,000, and I think that's where people, their eyes got really big and it was fun to talk about that in these uh, calls. But 7,000 three and four year olds have been impacted because of the tuition assistance. And maybe even more importantly, because we're raising the quality of our, our preschool providers. Um, over 130 area community preschools have increased their quality rating. CPS's reading and math scores and graduation rates have increased. And more CPS students are taking AP courses at all CPS traditional high school uh, high schools. Passio of passage of issue 17 continues and expands all the educational progress for these Cincinnati children. Um, it's already been endorsed by many of our community partners that each of you already know, but League of Women Voters, um, uh, Cincinnati Association, Cincinnati F Federation of Teachers, and many others. Um, you can register to vote until October 5th, and you can request a vote by mail um, right now. Early voting by mail and in-person starts August, I'm sorry, October 6th, and election day is November 3rd. So for more information on the voting, you can go to voteohio.gov or votehamiltoncounty.gov. But we ask for um, all of us on this call to continue to share the good news um, in these talking points with our family and friends and neighbors throughout the Cincinnati area uh, and ensure that we have a strong success for issue 17 as we saw back um, in 2016 when it originally passed. So I will stop there. Wonderful. Okay. Um, are there any other agenda items that maybe we did not include any kind of last minute thoughts or questions? Okay, so just to uh, moving on to our assignments and next steps, just to kind of summarize where we are. Um, I have I've written down that the shared vision resolution will be reviewed by the full board at its next meeting, which is next week, next Wednesday. Um, and then uh, uh, Preschool Promise through Father Graham will make sure that uh, CPP board acts on that um, in uh, before their October 23rd mm -hmm. so that we can deliver solid messaging to the community around our shared vision. Um, so the Carryover spending resolution sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
there's still sort of some some final uh, things that need to be done to that. And then that's going to come to the board as well. Um, Ms. Bolton? Uh, yes, I think uh, uh, Mr. Hoyne will have to send it uh, to uh, the Preschool Promise Board Council. Uh, I think uh, the current um, rendition of it uh, probably needs to be shared by Mr. Hoyne with the board, uh, literally over, um, uh, if you will, through uh, electronic uh, effort and maybe get some other uh, comments or thoughts. But uh, I think it's uh, close to where the board would be and where the treasurer and where the general counsel think it might be appropriate. And so it's possible that uh, it could be going over to at least this rendition could go back to uh, CPP uh, in the next day or two. And okay. certainly would be ready to be discussed uh, on Monday uh, based upon what uh, CPP uh, uh, reaction is and what have you. On Monday? On Wednesday? Well, we could, for us. Wednesday, excuse me, yes. yes. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. All right. Um, any any other next steps, uh, Father Graham? You and I, I think we'll continue to to talk about next planning. We we're doing this quarterly, and uh, I'm assuming I'm just assuming that the next meeting at our next quarterly meeting will be with CPP hosting. Um, but you and I can certainly talk more about that as we approach that time. Uh, plenty of time for that. Um... Absolutely. Uh, a quarter from now, with any uh, with any luck, we'll be having a uh, post um, uh, election victory party. Um, That's right. So yes. I, yes. I, I just want to underline. I just want to underline too that uh, as soon as you folks have an, have an opportunity as a board to um, uh, look at the resolutions and and um, uh, have a sense as to um, uh, them being uh, finished, uh, th then let us know and we'll. Um, but we'll uh, schedule our own board meeting as soon as we possibly can after that so that we can jump on board too. Wonderful. Okay, well, having no other business before us, I declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great thank night, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Thank you.